The US and EU have criticized Kosovo's government. That's after police used force to install newly elected ethnic Albanian mayors in a mostly ethnic Serb region. Serbia has put its army on high alert. What's behind this flare-up and could it spread? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. There's tension once again in northern Kosovo, this time after police use force to allow four ethnic Albanian mayors take up office after winning local elections. That vote was boycotted by most ethnic Serbs who make up the majority in the region. There's a geopolitical backdrop, too. Kosovo was once part of the former Yugoslavia. Now Russia backs Serbia and NATO supports Kosovo's independence, along with a large contingent of international troops. We'll be discussing the implications of this latest crisis with our guests in just a moment. But first, this report from Assad Beg in northern Kosovo. Police cars torched in Zvechan, the epicenter of the latest flare-up in northern Kosovo. The violence began after ethnic Serbs tried to prevent newly elected ethnic Albanian mayors from taking office. Special units of Kosovo's police responded with stun grenades and tear gas. Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic has responded by stationing his army on full combat alert near the Kosovo border. Uh, what the president is warning is that the prime minister of Kosovo will not stop and he will continue to carry out activities aimed at further aggravating the Serbian community. Ethnic Albanians form a majority of more than 90 percent in Kosovo. But in the north, ethnic Serbs make up the majority. They boycotted local elections in April, demanding greater autonomy. With a turnout of less than 4%, ethnic Albanians took control of local councils, some mayors elected with fewer than 200 votes. But Kosovo's prime minister says it was the duty of police to allow elected officials to take office without intimidation. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken tweeted saying, We strongly condemn the actions by the government of Kosovo that are escalating tensions in the north and increasing instability. While the German special envoy to the Western Balkans had this to say. I'm very convinced that yesterday was a bad day for Kosovo and for the whole Western Balkans region. These scenes of unrest have many fearing of an escalation in this volatile region. It is very worrying uh, because it's part of a pattern of worsening conditions on the ground. And we've also seen successive rounds of Western-led negotiations break down. Uh, because some very fundamental issues simply cannot be resolved on the ground presently, largely, again, owing to the intransigence of the authorities in Belgrade, who keep signaling and keep directing their various proxies in North Kosovo uh, to resist any form of integration with the local authorities. Ethnic Serbs in Kosovo's northern districts are loyal to Serbia and have never recognized Kosovo's independence, which it declared in 2008. The U.S., and most, but not all, EU countries have recognized its sovereignty. But Serbia is firmly opposed to its independence, along with its traditional ally, Russia and China. In these areas, Serbian flags fly prominently, but Kosovo police have begun taking the ones on government buildings down. And the thousands of NATO-led troops in Kosovo remain on high alert, trying to maintain a fragile calm. Asad Beg for Inside Story, Zvechen, Kosovo. Well, tensions between Serbia and ethnic Albanians in Kosovo have persisted for more than two decades. The collapse of Yugoslavia led to Europe's worst conflict since the Second World War. Kosovo, historically a southern province of Serbia, bid for autonomy, prompting another war in the 1990s. NATO bombed Serbia, and a multinational military force in Kosovo has kept an uneasy peace since then. In 2008, Kosovo declared independence, backed by most of the West, but not Serbia, Russia or China. To this day, incidents continue to flare up. In September, there were fierce protests by ethnic Serbs after Kosovo's authorities ordered Serbian vehicle license plates to be changed to Kosovar ones. And in December, the arrest of an ethnic Serb former police officer led to a tense standoff in northern Kosovo.
Well, let's bring in our guest now for today's Inside Story in Pristina, Dan Ilazi, head of research at the Kosovo Center for Security Studies in Belgrade, Helena Ivanov, associate research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society, and in Verona, Italy, Giorgio Frischioni, research fellow at the Italian Institute for International Political Studies. Balkans desk. A warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us on Inside Story. Dan, in Pristina, let me start with you. As we've seen in our report, flare-ups involving Serbs in northern Kosovo are a periodic occurrence. How dangerous is this latest escalation in the current domestic context in both countries and in the regional context as well? Well, uh, it's very dangerous, and uh, uh, civil society and researchers have been warned that we have been warning for years now that without a sustainable solution to the north of Kosovo, that these incidents with the potential to lead to violence will happen, and they did happen last year, and they continue to happen uh, this year as well. Uh, the situation in the north shows that uh, while this might look uh, about elections, this is not just about elections, this is about a bigger picture of the overall context of the relations between Serbia and Kosovo uh, and the situation in, in, in the north. Uh, as you uh, pointed out in the beginning, uh, uh, while Kosovo uh, it has declared independence, the, uh, Serbia continues to reject this, uh, and the EU is trying to facilitate the resolution of this dispute. And central to this dispute is recognition of Kosovo's independent state. And it's not just Serbia that's not recognizing, but the uh, mm -hmm. four and a half municip uh, four municipalities in the north uh, continue also to, to reject Kosovo authority. So this requires an urgent solution, uh, mm -hmm. and the EU is in a uh, uh, best fit to facilitate a proper solution uh, and, to the situation. And we'll di discuss the, the possible solutions a little later in the program. Helena, let me come to you and ask you about the mood in Belgrade. The Serbian army says it's at its highest level of alert. Uh, is this saber rattling in your view or is there a real risk of escalation today? Well, this is not the, the first time that we've heard the president and the government increase the combat readiness to the highest alert. So I guess that every time when we see similar escalations like the ones that we're seeing right now, this is the way in which Belgrade tends to respond. I think we find ourselves in a very difficult situation right now because there is no obvious solution going forward and because many other problems still remain open and unresolved despite some optimism after the dialogue in Brussels and then later on in Ohrid. Mm -hmm. uh, however, what I always say and what is really encouraging is that the international community is involved and is keeping a careful eye over what is going on. And I think the fact that K-4 troops are based there and are involved in the situation means that they can respond quickly and swiftly if this was to escalate uh, even further. But that that is as much as we can say right now. But I do think, and I would like mm -hmm. to agree with, with my colleague here, that we need a long-term solution to this problem. Right. Uh, let me just ask you, Helena, uh, to what extent are internal politics in Serbia also at play here? We've seen huge anti-government protests against the government in Serbia, calls for President Vucic to resign. Is that also playing a role here in these tensions between Serbia and Kosovo? Well, in a way, I would definitely say so. I think the Serbian government finds itself in a very difficult position. Four rounds of protests, massive, massive protests, um, against the government. Then, of course, uh, this pro-government rally that was organized on Friday, on the same day when the escalations in Kosovo reached their peak. I think all of this contributes to the destabilization in the country uh, more generally, and it definitely doesn't, doesn't help President Vucic, who is now trying to maintain this view that Serbia is united and that Serbia is stable. Right. Giorgio, let me come to you. What do you see as the real catalyst for this latest crisis? And who, in your view, bears responsibility for it? Yeah, um, what I see here is uh, a kind of uh, uh, game, let me call it like that, that has been going on for uh, uh, four years. So uh, the final goal is to prolong the status quo between uh, Kosovo and Serbia, because the, the status quo uh, uh, goes in the uh, uh, favor of both uh, countries' leaders. And what I see here is, uh, um, uh, let, me tell, let me be very honest, but a kind of uh, uh, same politics uh, as before the New Deal that was about to solve the situation. Mm -hmm. 
So they are trying to uh, recreate the same model of uh, a doc crisis, and then uh, both leader can uh, present themselves to both uh, uh, national groups and both, uh, I will also say, uh, electoral uh, bodies, their own electoral bodies, as the only defenders of uh, both national issues. And in this way, they can present themselves as the only uh, national leader in their own countries. And right. this kind of... Well, yeah. Giorgio, interestingly, I, I wanted to, to bring up this point uh, of the EU and uh, uh, the US openly criticizing Kosovo's government uh, for, for this latest escalation. We've heard the US uh, State Department uh, condemn the government's actions, saying they were taken against Washington's advice. This is quite significant, isn't it, for Kosovo's allies to condemn its actions. What is your reading of this? Um, the USA know that they have uh, a leverage on Kosovo government uh, exactly, exactly because they are the main sponsor of uh, Kosovo independence. So they want uh, all good for Kosovo. And because of this, they know that they can uh, as I said, have a leverage on their government. Um, but in my opinion, they are doing this because they are asking uh, the Serbian side to uh, do the uh, longest step. So to uh, arrive to a kind of de facto recognition of Kosovo independence. Mm. And in order to do that, uh, Kosovo side has to uh, implement the new agreement and the uh, most important part of this agreement is to implement the uh, association of Serbian municipality. Okay. And I think that is the very core of, uh, of the bilateral issue. Dan, what's your reading of the condemnation coming from Washington? And how do you think the Kosovar government would have received this? Well, I think it's very concerning uh, and a clear message. Uh, I personally do not think uh, that, you know, there is two ways to see it at this situation. The recent escalation from technical and legal perspective, you know, you had the new mayors elected. They were sent to the office, but I do not think it is smart nor right to install new mayor, uh, to install the mayors in their offices uh, by use of force or the police. So I don't think this also sends the right message to the Serbian population in the north about our willingness or the uh, readiness of the Kosovo government to facilitate integration uh, there. Right. So I think. But why did you think the Kosovo the... government did this? Why did they do this knowing that it was going to be provocative mm -hmm. and that it was going to stir tensions in the north? Why did they send this police escort? Well, I, I think uh, that they wanted to show that, you know, uh, uh, Kosovo institutions have the capacity to act uh, uh, throughout the country. You know, the, the, there was a legal obligation uh, for the mayors to um, uh, exercise their job. But at the same time, you cannot uh, detach this from the reality in the ground in the north, which is that, you know, it is a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, security wise, but also in terms of community, there is a different situation in the north of Kosovo, and the solution to the north goes through the dialogue that the EU is facilitating. The government, from the technical and legal perspective, was right in, in, in that aspect, but uh, it is never right, in my opinion, to use force uh, uh, in these cases, and the government should have perhaps tried to find another way, and the reason why EU and US uh, uh, reacted, I think, is that uh, perhaps these actions have undermined uh, uh, processes that are ongoing right now on the implementation of the recent agreement that was reached in February mm. between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, uh, and this agreement is quite important, and I would just like to disagree with the previous point. I don't think uh, one particular element of this agreement is important. All of it is important. There is 11 articles in total. Article right. 7 of this agreement talks about self-management. And uh, Kosovo needs to send the right messages that it is ready to integrate uh, the Serbian community in the country by establishing the, the Association of Serb Majority Municipalities, which was agreed actually in 2013 uh, by uh, uh, back then uh, the two prime ministers of Serbia okay. and Kosovo. So, and yeah. Let me ask Lena about so, this reality of, of uh, northern Kosovo that you talk about, Dan. W what's life like for ethnic Serbs, Elena, living in northern Co Kosovo? Uh, the, there's the issue of integration, of course, but given that they didn't participate in the recent local elections, to what extent are they also blame, uh, to, to blame for the situation uh, perhaps that they find themselves in today? 
Well, I think for ordinary citizens who live in the north north of Kosovo, the situation is very difficult. The relationship between their political representatives from Srpska Lista and the Belgrade regime is known to everyone, with many people suggesting that Belgrade often uses people from the north of Kosovo as their pawns and then kind of try and use the situation in Kosovo for their own political gains, which often means that these people do not receive the protection that they need. If you look at the situation realistically, as people were, you know, as, as, as the Kosovo police threw tear gas and shock bombs on Serbs who live in North Kosovo, the Belgrade government and most of Northern Serbs uh, uh, representatives were all in Belgrade for a rally. So I think they often find themselves abandoned and unprotected. And I think on the other hand, the Kosovo government very often, and as, as, as the incidents from two days ago also show, very often show that they're not really interested in engaging in a proper integration of this community. Mm. So I think they find themselves in a, in a very difficult situation honestly. Elena, Kosovo's government has in the past accused Russia, and I want to broaden out the discussion here a bit. They've accused Russia of supporting Serbia in stirring up these ethnic tensions. Serbia and Russia, of course, are traditional allies. Is Serbian policy and the current actions, is it independent uh, of, is it independent of Russian influence? Well, I think I think Russia is obviously trying to explore and use any cracks in the unity it can find. And it very clearly wants Serbia to keep the, its its view that it has right now, which is that Kosovo is, is part of Serbia's territory. And I think Russia, through RT and Sputnik, which are the two channels that continue to operate in Serbia, but also through various telegram channels, continues to disseminate its propaganda. I also do think that Serbia, on the other hand, also has to follow what the EU's policies are. So we've seen, you know, some desire from Belgrade to accept the deals that were proposed in Brussels and in Ohrid in recent months mm -hmm. and to try and sit at a negotiating table. But I think, you know, the, the situation is quite difficult and Russia is definitely, you know, abusing any cracks in the unity that, that it can find because it okay. wants to maintain its level of influence over Serbia. Right. Uh, Giorgio, what's your view of Russia's role here, if there is one? The Russians have pointed to Kosovo in the past as a justification for what they've done in Ukraine to justify their actions, perhaps, in taking parts of Ukraine and what they say is protecting the Russian-speaking population in Ukraine. Can we draw a parallel between this and the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Is there a possibility of a, of a similar scenario unfolding in Kosovo? Uh, in my opinion, there is no the possibility of a similar scenario for different reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, Russia is not uh, boots on the ground in the Balkans, and this has been like this for uh, 20 years now. Um, there are interests uh, uh, from a geopolitical point of view, and uh, as uh, my colleague before me said, there is much more interest in exploiting, uh, from a political point of view, the instabilities at the local level, because the more the Balkans are unstable, uh, the farer are from uh, from the European Union and from uh, uh, entering NATO, uh, in the case of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and, uh, and Serbia. Um, so the role of, of uh, Russia in the Balkans uh, it's a role of influence, and mm -hmm. uh, in the particular issue of the Kosovo, uh, it is an uh, uh, indirect role, so they are not uh, uh, having a direct influence in this issue, but uh, rather exploiting the main outcomes of these tensions and, uh, and uh, local uh, instabilities. So I don't think that there is the possibility of a Ukraine scenario, because that would be a, a military, politically, economic, uh, and uh, first of all, politically uh, suicide from uh, from uh, from Serbian side, mm. uh, because in my opinion, there is much more political convenience in uh, repeating that uh, there is uh, uh, a threat, uh, uh, a possible threat from the old enemy, rather than opening uh, uh, a war as uh, as we are seeing it in uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. But this right. saying this doesn't mean that. Uh, tensions are to be underestimated. The tensions are very serious and we have to monitor the situation. But I don't believe that uh, a war with the uh, open support of Russia is going to be a possibility. Dan, your thoughts about this, uh, th this possible scenario of uh, Kosovo uh, perhaps facing a similar situation as Ukraine? 
Well, uh, one thing we have learned with recent developments is that we cannot be complacent, not, I don't mean just here, but in Europe in general. No one thought uh, Russia perhaps, or many didn't think that Russia would have moved uh, um, uh, to do what it did in Ukraine uh, to invade the country, but it did. And the crazy thing is that right now in the Western Balkans, a few years ago, the possibility of open conflict was entirely missed. Uh, 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 or, or uh, disregarded today, it is not the case. Today, these tensions are uh, showing that it is possible. But in the case of Kosovo, and I want to echo the points from my colleagues that were mentioned before, the good thing is we have NATO uh, forces in the country. And I do not think uh, that uh, the scenario uh, like uh, with Russia and Ukraine is possible here because you have over 5,000 uh, um, NATO uh, soldiers in the country and NATO still by the international mandate is the uh, has the main responsibility or the mandate for a safe and secure environment. Mm -hmm. I do not think President Vucic would overstep uh, and and move in army uh, uh, and and because that would openly mean a conflict with with, with NATO. But at right. the same time, I think the Kosovo government should listen to the message that NATO and uh, EU are sending uh, because these kind of actions might create a situation whereby perhaps an official military uh, um, um, a conflict is, is not possible, but it is also undeniable that, uh, that there are very well armed groups in the right. north, uh, uh, and that could be some kind of a violence or, or control conflict there. So and Helena, as uh, sorry, as in uh, just to mention is that as you know, as Helena was mentioning, then the main consequences for this are citizens in the ground, the people, especially in the north, who are suffering through uh, through the situations. Indeed. Elena, so how then do we resolve the outstanding issues between these two countries? And why are we still in the same place more than 10 years after the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia began, supported by the EU, of course? Why haven't we moved towards more calmer relations, not necessarily recognition of Kosovo by Serbia, but more calmer relations between the two countries? Well, I think the first and the biggest problem is, of course, that we're speaking about two entities with mutually exclusive interest, which was always going to make the process of negotiating very, very difficult. Kosovo wants complete independence. Serbia absolutely refuses to recognize it. So from the very beginning, it was hard to find the you know middle ground, the solution that works. I think what further contributed to this is that the international community often made mistakes on the way. So, for example, if we look at today and the deals that were made in Brussels and Ohrid in the last few months, Obviously, obviously, everyone is asking themselves, are these really going to work? Because these mm -hmm. two deals are happening in the backdrop of the Brussels agreement that was signed in 2013 that still hasn't been fulfilled, which then, you know, questions the credibility of any deals that are either verbally accepted or signed. So I think that's that's the second problem. And then finally, the problem is that both Kosovo governments and Serbian governments have pushed for nationalistic discourses and played the nationalist card whenever that suited their personal and political gains. The problem with that is, of course, is that you disseminate these kinds of discourses, which then inevitably create a very complicated and difficult situation on the ground where the two communities can peacefully coexist in a very difficult way. Because if you feed people nationalistic propaganda, that's mm -hmm. bound to lead consequences on the ground. And in terms of how we move forward from here, well, you know, everyone has questioned the legitimacy of the local elections that happened in April because they were boycotted by the Serbs. Right. I think the first and foremost thing is to find a way to get this community back into the institutions and to then try and move forward, obviously, through, through dialogue. How do you get them back into the institutions? Well, I think <laughs> with a lot of difficulty, but I think, you know, another round of talks solely mm -hmm. dedicated to bringing the Serbs back into the institutions would be needed. Uh, I mean, just to, just to tell the viewers, uh, the Serbian representatives in north of Kosovo have demanded that the president Vucic stops any conversations with Pristina mm -hmm. until the situation on the ground is resolved. So I think the conversation between all the relevant entities aiming solely at bringing back the Serbs into the institutions and bringing the legitimacy into these institutions is absolutely crucial for going forward. Okay, Giorgio, your thoughts about how we move forward in this crisis. The EU has said that both Serbia and Kosovo need to normalize their relations if they wish to join the European Union bloc, of course. If the EU, let's say, were to accept both countries, do you think it could be something that could diffuse the tensions? Well, I do think that uh, uh, according to the new agreement, they have to implement all the 
uh, contents of this of this deal that they accepted and uh, uh, one of the main things uh, uh, that uh, that are uh, going to be uh, seen as uh, carrot and sticks are uh, from one side the uh, the EU path of both countries and the conference of donors uh, so uh, these two countries are going to receive uh, uh, funds that are going to be essential for their modernization and for the reforms and for uh, for their own uh, EU path. So I think that uh, uh, that should be the uh, how to see uh, the, the 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 best incentive for both sides. And uh, uh, if they see if from the EU side, they see that there is no implementation, no normalization, no concrete progress in the dialogue. Uh, this money is going to 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 miss, and uh, uh, they 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 cannot go along without that. So uh, mm. I think that um, uh, I'm I'm quite positive in this sense, and uh, mm. I hope I'm not wrong. OK, uh, so Dan, uh, Giorgio seems uh, to be positive. He says he's quite positive. What do you see as the solutions to these outstanding problems? There have been various efforts, of course, to diffuse these tensions over the years, but it seems like it's just kicking the can down the road every time. How do we solve it uh, ultimately? Uh, uh, the recent agreement that was reached in February uh, kind of hinted that uh, the process is moving towards what the, in the jargon of the EU, it is called a comprehensive legally binding agreement. And this word legally binding is euphemism for, uh, for from the EU's point of view, that both countries in a way no longer have these uh, uh, disputes with each other, mainly that Serbia no longer objects to Kosovo's independence, which doesn't necessarily mean acceptance. Uh, so I think way forward central is implementation. This is, uh, this is the key. Uh, and in order to come to a more effective implementation, the EU needs to push forward uh, and what I hear is that they are working on this, a sequenced plan about how uh, we go about implementing this, this recent agreement that was reached in February. And this re sequencing means that uh, very tangible, concrete actions, uh, what needs to take place when and by who. In, in, other, in other words, you know, this is uh, what the Kosovo government needs to do, and this is what the Serbian government needs to do. And this is important because trust is also another issue. Uh, and we have parties that have been negotiating in Brussels that uh, have clearly shown they have significantly, uh, uh, an, um, or they, they have absolutely no confidence in, uh, confidence in each other. So right now, uh, in implementing the recent agreement, I think both parties are concerned if uh, they would move with a step towards implementation, then they would not, the other party would not. So we hmm. need a sequence plan of action from, uh, from the EU, and we need to end appeasement. Uh, it's not just about, and I want to uh, also agree with the other points, but it's not just about incentives in terms of carrots, but uh, it's also about consequences that, right. you know, we cannot continue to have this kind of crisis uh, uh, perpetually. Uh, both Kosovo and Serbia want to become members of the UN and have contractual relations with you in the form of a stabilization association agreement. And these contracts clearly say, both for Kosovo and Serbia, that if uh, either side is not making progress towards normalization of relations, that EU can suspend uh, the process. Uh, so we need uh, to end appeasement. Uh, I understand that uh, from the side of President Bucci, as my colleague was mentioning, he's facing right now uh, domestic pressure uh, due to uh, corruption, uh, um, attacks on media, okay. uh, or, or lack of freedom. And, and so sorry, but just to end at this point, and, and, uh, and he might abuse the case of Kosovo mm -hmm. uh, uh, to continue status quo. And so I, okay. need, I think resolution of, of, of this situation is, is important on many, uh, many levels, not just... Thank you very much. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all three of you for a very insightful conversation. Thank you, Dan Ilazi, Elena Ivanov, Giorgio Frisioni. And thank you as well for watching. You can always watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuli Batibo and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.